In today's video, we're going to take a data-driven look at the 10-round ladder test load development style and see if we should stop using this technique here on the channel. Welcome to this week's episode of Bolt Action Reloading. Stick around. For quite a while now, I have been starting my load development with the 10-shot load development method, also known as the Saturday method, the Crichton Audette ladder test, the incremental ladder test, and also the 20-round string method. They are all very similar, but not the same. Since I have implemented this method, my number one negative comment when starting load development series, no matter what the cartridge, is you should stop promoting this method, it doesn't work, it's statistically insignificant. One commenter even said, I think the confidence interval for your velocity at each point is so large as to make the exercise of looking for a flat spot meaningless. In today's video, we're going to give a summary of this method, show you some examples that I've actually run here on the channel, so you can decide for yourself. For those of you that might not be familiar with it, don't worry, we're going to talk about what it is, go over pluses and minuses at the end. The biggest thing I hope is that you keep an open mind until the end of the video and draw your conclusions after you've actually seen all of the data. The goal of today's video is not to try and get you to stop using OCW or whatever your method that you're using is. The goal of today's video is to simply analyze the 10 round ladder test development style and see if it gives data that's of value. So let's begin. The basics of the 10 shot load development style, or whatever you'd like to call it, is actually loading one given charge weight at each round. Depending on the actual case volume, you'll increase your charge weight in 0.2 or 0.3 grain increments. You pretty much have to have a chronograph to use this type of method as you need to know the velocity of your rounds. If you wanted to try without a chronograph, you could try going at a significant distance, maybe at least 300 yards. but then you're going to be introducing more shooter error into determining whether or not the vertical is again the shooter or the load. Preferably you would use a chronograph to measure your velocities and chart the results. Please keep in mind, you must have all of the same component combination. You don't want to be mixing load head stem brass, different lots of components. You want to make sure that all of them are identical. If you're going to try and load mix head stamp brass, this is not going to be the right method for you. I'm not going to be sure what exactly right method would be for you, but this isn't it. I'm going to link in the description box below a video that's going to go into far more detail about how this exactly works, but as we walk through the data, hopefully you'll be able to understand exactly what we're talking about and look at the data from the initial velocity curve as well as the data we actually generated. Today we're going to take a look at three specific examples that we've ran very recently here on the channel to see if we can actually extract any value out of the slow development style. The goal of our testing is simply being able to take a group of unknown components. Maybe we don't have access to the powder we want to choose. We have to switch to a different one. Getting as much information as rapidly as possible is, in my opinion, what this test is really good at. We're going to be looking at that in more detail as we continue down our road realizing that two people will look at the same thing and perceive it completely different. My goal is not to change your mind. The only thing we're going to do is analyze some data and see if it's valuable. One of my favorite quotes of all time is from W. Edwards Deming, In God we trust, all others bring data. And today is all about data. It should go without saying, but today we're going to be looking strictly at velocity data, not groups. If your firearm doesn't group at the place where it shoots the lowest standard deviation, this isn't going to fix your problem. This is strictly trying to zero in on a low extreme spread, low standard deviation load as rapidly as possible. So after we've generated our data, we're going to need to plot it. I use Excel, but there are plenty of free software to do such things out there. We are charting velocity versus charge weight. I would assume if you wanted to chart the absolute value of velocity from point to point, you could probably view it this way as well. However, what we're going to be looking at are velocity charts, and we're looking for a change in charge weight where little or no velocity increase or decrease is seen. These are very commonly referred to as velocity nodes or plateaus. It doesn't matter what we call it. What we're really looking for is a place where the charge weight changes and the velocity doesn't. So let's bring out example number one. The first example we're going to put on your screen, this is a real chart. It's not fiction. This is a real test that I ran and I've published data a while ago here on the channel. As you can see, this is data from the 110 grain ATIP with H4350. Hornady Brass and the CCI 250 Primer. You'll see that our initial test went from 40.2 grains all the way to 42 grains. Analyzing this chart, we can see at 40.8 and 41 grains, there was actually identical velocities recorded. Moving up the chart a little further at 41.8 and 42 grains, the difference in velocity from those two data points is only 2 feet per second. 
If you're not concerned with having the highest velocity, then 40.8 and 41 grains is probably the area to concentrate on. Loading more samples to test in that area would be what you would probably want to do. However, for a longer distance, higher velocity, if we can get a good load there, would be something I am interested in. So the testing we're going to look at is essentially doing an OCW test at that higher range. If I didn't say it already, I should have said, I don't think this is a replacement for OCW. It's simply to get you to the load you want to find a little faster. Keeping in mind it was probably at least 30 degrees warmer on our day of test, we're going to see increased velocities from our initial test. That shouldn't surprise anyone. Even though we're using H4350, it's a temperature stable powder. It is not immune to velocity increases when the temperature rises. It just tries to make it less. For our test today, we used the same lot of brass, same primers, powder. Everything was pretty much identical. We chose to start just off the beginning of the node at 41.6 grains, testing it in 0.2 grain increments all the way to 42.2 grains. So we're actually going to test one step above the maximum that we previously tested. Starting off at 41.6 grains, even though our previous test generated 2972 feet per second, our average velocity was 3005 feet per second. Standard deviation was 15.7 and with an extreme spread of 38. Moving on to 41.8 grains, our average velocity actually dropped to 2997. Our standard deviation dropped significantly to 6.4, extreme spread of 15. And it certainly is a good candidate for being the center of the node that we're looking for. When our test increased to 42 grains, our average velocity increased to 3,015 feet per second. Standard deviation jumped to 26.3 with an extreme spread of 65, which gave us a pretty good clue that we were off of our node. 42.2 grains gave us a higher velocity of 30-32 feet per second. Standard deviation of 18.9 with extreme spread of 52. If anybody is concerned with the charge weights not being close enough, all of our charge weights were measured today without exception on our FX120i, and all these were measured to be consistent within one granule of powder. Yes, not a grain, a granule. H4350's granule weight is somewhere around 0.03 grains per granule. The FX120i reads in 0.02 grain increments. All of our charge weights were as absolutely exact as I could make them, far more than a 0.1 grain resolution. Having a highly accurate scale still isn't going to fix if you're loading on a bad spot in your curve. Solely being able to make sure your powder charge is as exact as possible isn't going to, by itself, lower your standard deviations and extreme spreads. You still have to do good load development. Clearly, if we're looking at our chart, 41.8 grains seemed like it might be the center of our node, being as we are again looking for spots in our chart where velocity does not increase or decrease, and that's exactly what we found. Again. Not a lot of samples, but it put us very close to the area we wanted to analyze. If we hadn't found any good loads there, we could have easily dropped down and explored that 40.8, 41 grain area and to see what type of response we got there. It's very likely that might be a more forgiving load, but again, in this particular case, we were looking for slightly higher velocities. Overall, in this example, I think the chart served its purpose. Normally, this is how I would use this method, but let's look at it from a different perspective. Depending on the data we see in our chart, would it possibly make us overlook something that's good? Let's look at that situation. Example number two, 30-06 Springfield. Again, another chart we've shown here on the channel before. This is low development for the 150 grain gold dot with H4350 and the BR2 primer. Starting off from 59.6 to 62.3, we could see we increased our increment in between charge weights to 0.3 from 0.2 in our previous cartridge, and this is the data we generated. Looking at our data, it appears that somewhere in between 60.5 and 61.4, that that area is fairly erratic. And during normal load development, I would try and ignore those areas. But being critical of this method, we might want to look there. Maybe that's where we're going to find one of our better loads. Certainly wasn't what I expected, but I thought we would test it. We started off at 60.6 grains, did five different charge weights, increasing in 0.2 grain increments. Same condition as before, the temperature was warmer on this day of test than it was during our initial curve generation. Starting off at 60.6 grains, we saw our average velocity was 29.43 feet per second. Our standard deviation right to start with was 6.5 with an extreme spread of 15. So a pretty good start right on the edge of where we seem to see erratic behavior in our curve. Moving on to the next step at 60.8, a slight increase in velocity to 29.48. The standard deviation increased to 11.3 with an extreme spread of 25. Moving on to 61, velocity significantly increased, 29.67 feet per second. Standard deviation increased as well to 15.8, extreme spread of 39. 
So essentially in the center of what looks to be erratic has a fairly large extreme spread. Moving on to 61.2 grains, 29.63 feet per second. So we actually saw a drop in average velocity. Standard deviation dropped to 11, extreme spread of 23. Then moving on to 61.4 grains, moving just to the edge of where we were finding stable velocities. We found a average velocity of 29.94. Standard deviation dropped to 4.9, extreme spread of 13. So in our second example there, I'm not sure that 61.4 grains would be exactly where I wanted to end up with this load. I would be tempted to try just a little bit higher to see what our response was there. But I was very pleased to see, though it was not intentional, that on either side of those curves we had standard deviations, which I would certainly think are acceptable. And then as our graph showed us, erratic data in the middle. Believe it or not, guys, these are the most recent groups and velocity testing that I've done here on the channel. From the data recording this video, these were shot three days ago. All of the data we're talking about, aside from the initial charts, was acquired at a range trip three days ago. Moving on, example number three. For example number three, we're, this was basically a primer test. We're going to get into more detail of this in a different video, but I also thought that it illustrated an interesting response that we should talk about when it comes to analyzing with using this 10-shot load development style. The five charts you'll see on your screen are actually five different primers. This is identical lots of brass, powder, and projectile. The only difference is the primer. Now, this is some work I'm doing in 308, so you can see the increment between the graphs has shrunk down to about 0.2 grain increments. Simply just doing a rough look at these graphs, uh, testing five separate primers, we might have saved ourselves an awful lot of time. Looking at the charts themselves, we can see with the first chart, at the very beginning, there's some erratic changes which are showing up to 50 feet per second differences in 0.2 grain increments. The chances of being able to find a low SD load, at least down in that area, is very low. And I would rather see what a different primer would give us. I know everyone can look at this data and see different things in it. If I was to have picked our first primer and ran a OCW test, I would likely have been very disappointed with most of the results that I got. If for some reason the exact powder you were familiar with was out of stock and you wanted to try something else, I think it's very possible that you could go looking to see what possible primers you had in stock versus the powder you wanted to test to see if you could test that combination with very few rounds to give you a clear indication from the very beginning whether or not you were going to be able to generate acceptable results. Another one of my favorite quotes that I don't remember where it came from was that you can't really tell if a load is good with three shots, but you can certainly tell if it's bad with three shots. And I think that this is no different. A fair criticism would have been, we didn't get to see all of those primer tests on the same vertical axis. So here's another graph where I'll put them all on the same vertical axis so you can see them better. Hopefully it still illustrates to you the same things that we have certain primers that respond differently than others. Some have a more linear response, some are more erratic. Personally, if I was picking a primer out of there, I would like to pick one that shows less erratic in my testing and at least do my initial results with those. I'm never gonna say you can't find good results with the other ones, but if our goal is to find the fastest way to the best load, that is what I would try. After we reviewed all these three examples, let's look at some of the benefits and weaknesses of this method. Benefit number one, when we're starting off with components that we've actually never tested before, ensuring that our load is safe is priority number one. By doing this test, we can start lower, go up higher. You can choose the increment, which makes most sense for you. Maybe you decide to use 10, 15, or 20 rounds, whatever makes sense. Loading one round at each pressure weight will allow us to cover a lot of ground relatively quickly. If we find out we've loaded a lot of components where it appears pressures are not safe, we have far less rounds to take apart, and in my opinion, far less components wasted. Benefit number two, very few components are used to generate the data. Not sure more needs to be said, if this allows us to zero in on a good load very quickly, I think that this is 10 rounds well spent. Benefit number three, even if this method does not tell us exactly what load will be our best right out of the gate, it's at least giving us a good idea of areas that we should avoid. Anytime when I've seen this erratic behavior, I've never been able to find a good SD load on any of those areas. So generally, it's some place that I would avoid testing at. Benefit number four, it's possible to evaluate different lots of components with different combinations. I'm often looking for the best performing primer for possibly a new powder that I'm testing. Just because one primer worked well with a particular powder doesn't mean it's gonna work with the next powder that I want to test. 
Being able to run identical testing with different primers, looking at that velocity response is going to give me more confidence when I know I spend a lot of time building those loads and testing them that I have a higher likelihood of having good results when my testing is complete instead of starting over. Maybe there's more benefits, but at least some of those are some of the clear ones to me. Drawback number one, after running the initial test, you're still not going to have statistically significant data. I would argue that if you're seeing large amounts of variation, there is enough information there to tell you you're not going to find a good load there. But on the contrary, even if you saw identical velocity for three separate charge weights in a row, there's no guarantee that when you test that, your extreme spread is going to be low. I just think it's more likely. Drawback number two, you're not going to be able to perform all your testing on the same day. You're going to need more testing to confirm your loads. If you only shoot 10 loads in one day, you're not going to have enough confidence with that day's test to be able to go to a match. At least, not if you're me. But I think the information is beneficial nonetheless. Drawback number three. If you're shooting at short distances, the standard deviation matters very little. You're probably honestly more concerned with groups. Velocity difference rarely shows up on paper at 100 yards. In fact, until you're stretching out to some more significant distances, possibly 300 and beyond, you might not really see a significant vertical string Again, depending on how bad your extreme spread is, it's only where this testing goes to longer ranges where these things become more significant. So any way you choose to look at it, I really think that there are some good reasons to still continue using this method here on the channel. If you're concerned with standard deviation, extreme spread, and shooting at longer distances, I think that this is a very interesting tool to gain information. It's going to cost you a range trip, but if you are using OCW alone, there's no guarantee you would have walked away from the range with a good load either. Thank you guys for sticking around to look at all of the data and keeping an open mind. If you like these crazy videos, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Here are a couple additional videos that you might enjoy. I hope you come back next week. And until then, stay safe in small groups.